The lessons we ponder today from part of the call of the prophet Ezekiel and from Mark's account of what Jesus experienced when he returned to his hometown of Nazareth present some interesting realities to us. Ezekiel and Jesus were commissioned by God and were sent to present God's message to the people of their time and place. And in the lesson from Ezekiel, God described the people to whom he would be, to whom the prophet would be sent in very, well, let's just say unfavorable terms. Uh, rebels, impudent, and stubborn. Ezekiel was one of the Hebrew people who were captured and removed to Babylon at the start of the 6th century before the time of Jesus. And Ezekiel, like his fellow exiles, had seen the horrors of war. He had lost loved ones. He had been forced to leave his homeland. He was a priest of God who was forced to leave the temple where God was worshipped. And Ezekiel's challenge was to call his fellow Hebrews living in exile, as well as those who remained in their homeland, to accept the exile as God's judgment on the systemic and prolonged wickedness of their society. That was not an easy call for Ezekiel to answer. It would not be easy to tell people what they didn't want to hear. People want to hear that they are good people. People want to hear that they're okay. People want to hear that they are not accountable for what happens to them. They wouldn't want to believe that their plight was God's judgment on their national character. They prefer to quickly get back to the way things were. And in the lesson from Mark's gospel, Jesus was amazed. Amazed. Imagine that. Jesus, God walking around, is amazed. Can you imagine God being amazed? We find in the text, Jesus was amazed when the people of his hometown refused to believe his message of repentance, grace, and truth, and openly doubted that God's power was operating through him. They didn't want to believe that God would use someone they supposedly knew so well to do what Jesus was doing. Together, Ezekiel and Jesus show that God sends humans. Ezekiel is called mortal to remind us that God sends humans as agents of divine truth. Yes, God sends people like us to do what people like Ezekiel did, do what Jesus did. God sends people like us to speak God's words of repentance and grace and truth. God sends people like us to confront entrenched systems of oppression. God sends people like us to tell and show a hateful society and a world that lives on hate what love means. God sends people like us, yeah, us, to tell and show a fearful world about welcoming strangers. Yes, including immigrants and people who are different from us. People who don't think like we do, or look like we do, pray like we do, worship like we do, dress like we do. God sends people like us to tell and show a despondent world the meaning of hope and joy. God sends people like us to speak God's truth to people hooked on lies. And like Ezekiel and Jesus, we will find that being sent 
by God to say and to be and to do something doesn't necessarily automatically easily mean that people will accept what we say or accept who we're trying to be or accept what we're trying to do. The call to be God's people of grace and truth is a call to faithfulness. It is not a call to popularity or fame. It's often a call to confront divine truth, to present divine truth in the face of entrenched lies. Which reminds us that we shouldn't measure our effectiveness for God by the ordinary standards of outcome. You know, we are big on measuring stuff. A baby doesn't wind up very few minutes in the world before the baby is measured. <laughs> the baby is only a few minutes old, and the baby is measured, weighed, and for the rest of our lives, we are, we're measured. We're trying to figure out how we stack up. And we're big on testing outcomes. We're big on measuring stuff. And we don't usually understand that in God's way of dealing with things, we're not given the standards for measuring the ordinary way. God calls us to faithfulness, not to finding what the facts are behind the outcomes of our faithfulness. Do you know that there are things that you and I are called to do for God that we will never get the facts on? Before you think I'm making this up, what teacher teaches, prepares a lesson plan, and has the facts about how many students are going to turn out as teachers? Yet every teacher starts out as a student in somebody's classroom. And if the teacher measures his or her effectiveness on how many children he or she sees are teachers, the teacher may go through his or her career despondent because teaching isn't a very, very well compensated position. You work real hard, you're not really appreciated, you're not very well paid. Somebody ought to say, man, who knows something about teaching? And 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 you know, you get these hard headed parents who don't do anything to help their children. They expect you to turn people they have raised into geniuses. And you get school systems that don't provide you with the resources. You don't have the resources and you get blamed. You get blamed. Oftentimes we make the mistake of deciding how effective our lives are for God based on how people measure us. What Ezekiel, what Jesus found out was the test for effectiveness is not how people measure us, but how God assess our faithfulness. It is our faithfulness, not the standards people use to attest us, that determines how effective we are for God. And sometimes faithfulness doesn't produce easy facts to see. Abraham and Sarah had been married for decades. Decades! And had been waiting for decades after God had promised them a son. Faithfulness doesn't always produce quick facts. And we who are in the instant age, you know, we have these. Now, you know, if you get look for something on the internet, if it takes longer than this, we complain, we know, uh, <laughs> we, want, we talk about download speeds. And the download speeds are not in minutes, they're in seconds. They're in shorter than seconds, they're in megabytes per second. 
We expect instant results from complicated problems. We expect instant cures from entrenched issues. We expect to see instant answers to old and deep problems. And if we do not see them, we blame the people who say that God answers the problem. That's the test. Will the people of God be faithful to proclaim God's truth to a world that expects snap answers, easy answers to deep moral, ethical problems. Hmm. Deep problems. Old problems. Nasty problems. Nagging problems. Well-rooted problems. Jesus and Ezekiel show that God calls us to be Faithful gardeners. You know what gardeners do. Gardeners sow and they cultivate. We are called to sow and to cultivate God's love and truth in the world. And like Ezekiel and Jesus, we will find that human hearts can be full like any garden of rocks and stumps and weeds. Like Ezekiel and Jesus, we will find that human hearts will not often want to give up their rocks, will not often want to give up their stumps. They will often prefer the weeds. Like Ezekiel and Jesus, we will confront and expose the rocks and the stumps and the weeds of pride and greed, of fear and hate and unbelief, and like Ezekiel and Jesus, we'll find that people would rather keep their rocks and their stumps and their weeds than accept the cultivating influence of God's love and God's truth. Yet we are called to plant God's love and truth. We're called to plant and then to plow. And in plowing, you gotta, you got to move some rocks. <laughs> it's real hard to grow a crop. With rocks. And plowing, you've got, to, you've got to dig and get the rocks out. And understand the analogy only goes so far. Usually, the ground doesn't suck the rock in. <laughs> but human hearts hold on to their rocks. We make gods of our rocks. We make gods of our stumps. We make gods of our weeds. And it's real hard to grow a crop when the ground has made a god out of weeds. That is the dilemma that we face in being people of God's truth, in speaking God's truth. It's hard to speak God's truth and see God's truth grow up when people are addicted to the weeds of lies, to the weeds of their stumps. We see this even now. We see this no matter how much you and I want to represent God's truth, people have the moral freedom to believe lies. People have the moral freedom to believe that God wants them to mistreat others. People have the moral freedom to believe that God wants them to fear strangers rather than to welcome and help them. People have the moral freedom to believe that God doesn't want them to face the consequences of their persistent moral and ethical transgressions and derelictions. In our society, people are hooked on the lies about the supposed end of racism. You recall after President Obama was elected, we are supposed to have entered this, entered this post-racial society. We've got hooked on the lie of post-racism. 
despite evidence of white supremacy and how it violates the gospel of God's love and truth and repentance and restoration. And so when a few days ago a man massacred nine black people in Mother Emmanuel Church in South Carolina who were studying scripture and praying, it was amazing how quickly people wanted to believe lies. He just had to be crazy. He just had to be crazy. Or he just, it, 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 he, he just deranged. He's an isolated person. An isolated incident. Now the alleged perpetrator, supposedly crazy, wrote a manifesto that explicitly expressed his desire to terrorize black people based on a doctrine of white supremacy espoused by a group that calls itself the Council of Conservative Christians, Citizens, Conservative Citizens. So if he's crazy, there's a council of crazy people <laughs> that he's getting his craziness from, right? Because he, he subscribed. So, so, so if he's a lone actor getting his information from a council, how can he be a lone actor? How can he have the lone mindset from a council? But he's crazy. Now, the Council of Conservative Citizens was formed in 1985. But that was not when it had its beginning. That's when it was formed. You understand? You can be known by a previous name. Folks have changed their name before. You understand that. Before 1985, they operated under a different name called the White Citizens Council. Hello? This may be history for some of us. The White Citizens Council was formed in July of 1954. 1954. You recall what happened in 1954 in May. The Supreme Court of the United States handed out a decision that outlawed racial segregation education. Two months later, the White Citizens Council was organized in Mississippi. The White Citizen Council was a network of white supremacist groups that developed. And Dylan Roof, the man who allegedly massacred the nine black worshipers at Mother Emanuel Church on the 17th of June, was radicalized by the successor organization of the White Citizens Council. Now, the White Citizens Council was largely responsible for the resurgence of the Confederate battle flag. The Confederate battle flag wasn't really flown in the South until after the White Citizens Council started operating after the Supreme Court outlawed segregation in education. The White Citizens Council was largely responsible for organized efforts to intimidate black people who are to vote in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and Arkansas and Tennessee and North Carolina and South Carolina and Florida. Yes, yes, yes. The White Citizens Council was responsible for efforts in Arkansas to find out who the NAACP members were so they could be fired from their jobs. And these were a group of business people. These were not your standard variety so-called good old boys, the so-called rednecks. These were the Sirsoka suit and straw hat wearing folk. 
plantation owning folk, the folks who own the company store, folks who ran the bank, the doctors, the lawyers, and the preachers. Hello? Let's be very clear. The Council of Conservative Citizens is merely the 2015 version of the Racist White Citizens Council. And so when Senator Tom Cotton gets money from the Council of Conservative Citizens and takes it and keeps it, he knows where it came from. You mean I'm going to take $10,000 from somebody and claim I don't know where it came from? Now, why is this important? Sadly, nobody has been calling out and relating Dylan Roof to the Conservative Council of Citizens. You know why? Because Senator Cotton took their money. Ted Cruz took their money. Other folks took their money. Trent Lott spoke to them when he was majority leader of the Senate. These are folks that have been part of the lie that the Confederate flag is not about hate, it's about heritage. And sadly, President Obama hadn't called out this group either. Now, I say this because he had his chance. You recall, President Obama showed up at a funeral and had a chance to speak truth. Hello? Speak truth in the face of the lie that what killed those nine people was just a lone gunman. President Obama had a chance to say, there's a relationship between the hate in the killer's heart and the hate that these people spouse. He didn't. President Obama had a chance to say that the Council of Conservative Citizens is a terrorist organization. You understand, if this had been a Muslim group, and if the killer had been a Muslim, that it belonged to the Taliban, it would have been a connection between the killer and the Taliban without any problem. But because the killer is a white Lutheran, as opposed to a Muslim from Afghanistan, we don't call them that. We don't say that this is a terrorist organization. We haven't been reminded that the Confederate flags were used by white supremacists to intimidate black people, not to celebrate anything but to intimidate. And so we are seeing in our time what Ezekiel and Jesus experienced in their time. We are seeing intelligent people refuse to accept the truth. A truth that Dr. King declared even beyond the grave. In January of, 2000, January of 1989, Playboy magazine, don't get mad at me, Playboy magazine published an essay I know you're wondering, why is he reading Playboy magazine? You, he, in, in January 1989, Playboy magazine published an essay titled A Testament of Hope, written by Martin Luther King, Jr. What do you mean? King was murdered in April 1968. This essay was published almost a year later. Listen to what Dr. King said. Why is the issue of equality still so far from solution in America, a nation that professes itself to be democratic, inventive, 
hospitable to new ideas, rich, productive, and awesomely powerful. The problem is so tenacious because despite its virtues and attributes, America is deeply racist and its democracy is flawed both economically and socially. All too many Americans believe justice will unfold painlessly or that its absence for black people will be tolerated tranquilly. And then Dr. King wrote, white America must recognize that justice for black people cannot be achieved without radical changes in the structure of our society. The comfortable, the entrenched, the privileged cannot continue to tremble at the prospect of change in the status quo. Dr. King wrote, if we look honestly at the realities of our national life, it is clear we are not marching forward. We are groping and stumbling. We are divided and confused. Our moral values are, and our spiritual confidence sink even as our material wealth ascends. In these trying times, the black revolution is exposing evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals systemic rather than superficial flaws and suggests that radical reconstruction of society itself is the real issue to be faced. We haven't heard these words happen before. One last excerpt. Quote, many whites hasten to congratulate themselves on what little progress we Negroes have made. I'm sure most whites felt that with the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, all race problems were automatically solved. Because most white people are so far removed from the life of the average Negro, there has been little to challenge this assumption. Yet Negroes continue to live with racism every day. It doesn't matter where we are individually in the scheme of things, how near we may be either to the top or the bottom of society. The cold facts of racism slap each one of us in the face." Close quote. I wish President Obama had quoted those words at the service for Reverend Pinckney. Rather than led the congregation singing Amazing Grace. Now I love Amazing Grace. But you know there's a problem with singing about Amazing Grace. In order for us to get to the grace, we have to do the theological work of repentance. Hello. Hello. You don't get repentance without grace. You can't hip scop over repentance and start singing Amazing Grace. Now, I admit that President Obama had a decent baritone. I admit that he made a wonderful, good image. And I admit that everybody, it was good political theater, but it was unsound theology. And the issue for us is in the house of God, however, and whatever else ought to happen, we ought to have some truth. And certainly we ought to have some truth when people are grieving. When people have had their hearts traumatized by murder, by mass murder, they need truth. They need to deal with the issue of repentance and then be talked to about grace. Repentance and grace go hand in hand. And any notion of grace without repentance is not biblical. It is not Christian. Grace is free, yes. But grace, pardon my grammar, ain't never cheap.
And the problem we have with the issue of racism in our society is we insist on cheap grace. We want to jump over repentance. And when the president does it, it's okay. The last thing I would remind us is that grace requires us to confront repentance, and repentance requires us to con confront the pain that sin causes. A lot has been said about the healing in the wake of the tragedy in South Carolina. Change that, not tragedy, the massacre. Massacre. It's not a tragedy. A tragedy is something that is accidentally, but unavoidable, bad. For instance, lightning strikes somebody. It's a tragedy. Somebody is crossing the street and Dies of a heart attack. That's a tragedy. But when somebody plans to kill people and then goes where they plan to kill people and then kills people as planned, that's not a tragedy. The word we have for that is massacre. And it's dangerous when people who know what words mean use words that do not mean what they say to describe what happens. This is the challenge of speaking God's truth to people who are addicted to lies. Because when we are addicted to lies, we will not recognize lies when we hear them. We will believe the lies because we like the liar. And even if the liar looks like us, even if the liar is somebody we voted for, if the liar lies, it's still. Well, Reverend, what would you have us do as people of faith? I would have us remember what Ezekiel was told. I wish that Mr. Obama had, instead of having them sing Amazing Grace, would have declared that veneration of the Confederate flag that Dylan Roof was wearing and white supremacy and the so-called heritage that the Confederate flag stand for has been condoned by society. I wish that religious leaders from every persuasion, but especially leaders of congregations that profess to be following the God of Ezekiel and Jesus and Martin King would have denounced the veneration of this so-called white Southern heritage that is actually just code words for white racism and supremacy. It's not enough for us to engage in master performances of amazing grace at the funeral of people who've been massacred by murderers. We must name the root cause of the hate. We must name the root cause of the murder. We must call our society to admit its racism and to repent from it. We must call on repentance and then we can sing about. Only then can we sing about and correctly speak about amazing grace. To speak about grace without repentance is to cheapen and to mock the love and justice of God. It's not enough for Walmart to remove the Confederate flags from the merchandise. We must ask, why did you think it was right to have them there in the first place? Why did you think it was right to sell a symbol of hate and make a profit on it until folks got killed behind it? 
how long will it be before you expect us to forget that they were dead? Before you ease the material back onto the shelves to get the money? By the way, yesterday in Searcy, Arkansas, Confederate sympathizers were welcomed to demonstrate on a Walmart store parking lot on the 4th of July. Until people of God's faith protest and confront and condemn this kind of mindset, we will continue to be victims of the lies. And you understand, when the prophets act like the lies aren't lies, we cannot expect the people to recognize the truth. Bottom line is, prophetic people aren't called to be popular. We're called to speak God's truth. And speaking God's truth is not popular. Just ask Moses going to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Speaking God's truth isn't popular. Just tell, just talk to John the Baptist telling Herod, you really shouldn't have your brother's wife. Speaking God's truth isn't popular. But speaking God's truth is what God calls God's people to do. Amen.